Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Colby Pitts. I'm the FFL coordinator for Hernando County. I'm here with Master Gardener Bernie. Um, Dr. Bill is out today, so uh, it'll be just us two, as uh, as we've done a few times in the past. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and leave them in the comments, and uh, we'll do our best to give you a nice, um, maybe not succinct, but an accurate answer. Um, Bernie, do you have anything in particular you'd like to talk about today? Well, I've had uh, a couple of people in this morning uh, brought in lawn samples, and uh, we can discuss uh, what what the uh, current big thing is, which is one always the St. Augustine lawns here. Um, fella had uh, classic take all root rot. Uh, you know, I I cannot overemphasize you have to mow this stuff at four inches that if if you mow it at two inches which is what everybody does the the root structure is only a couple inches long so you go out you mow you mow the grass at two inches especially in the summer then you water it your one day is which is all you're allowed and uh, three quarters of an inch of water completely takes care of a foot of soil so you, you, you're very careful. You don't want to overwater. You don't want to underwater. You put down the right amount. You've mowed your lawn at two inches. It looks beautiful. Uh, well, the thing about it is if, if the roots are only two inches long, in a couple of days, the, the roots aren't in where the water is. The, the top mm -hmm. two inches dry out right away. And now there's plenty of water in the soil. But the plant isn't getting it. The the, the mm -hmm. grass is screaming. It needs something, and and once the grass is under stress, uh, in our county anyway, take all root rot is super prevalent. So, mm -hmm. uh, you because you mow it short, you develop a fungus infection, and it's difficult to explain to people how critical this is. If you mow it at four inches, the the root structure goes eight to 12 inches long well eight to 12 inches of root keeps you in the water all week long so uh is is being able to water one day a week enough well it is if you mow at four inches it isn't mm -hmm. if you mow at two inches and and a really good example of that is a golf course the the greens are mowed at a half inch or three eighths of an inch but they have to water them every night every night every night mm -hmm. uh, you know and 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 they've got professionals that are coming in and really taking care of that because if, if you foul up one or two days you wipe out a green and, and mm -hmm. it's a very expensive thing to resod the greens so you know the, the golfer uh... should should understand that if you're gonna mow at two inches you've got to have a truck bring in water from out of state because it's not legal to use our water out of mm -hmm. the aquifer on your on your lawn and uh, yeah and there's, it's a, there's no reason to have to if you mow it at a higher higher rate so uh that's that's the the number one thing and i get that uh every week every week every week <clears throat> oh yeah and, um, and I it's get funny a little ruler and say here take this ruler go home and, and measure and look and, and see it. you know if it if it's not four inches show this to the guy that's mowing the lawn and say can you mow it so that it comes up to here and if he says yes and doesn't do it you don't pay him and if he says no you get somebody else and if he does uh, mow it four inches then your problems go away it, it helps keep the weeds down makes the lawn healthy everybody's much happier so. mm -hmm. yeah your stronger grass is going to keep is going well it stays healthier that take all root rise really opportunistic so it's waiting just waiting biding its time waiting for your grass to be stressed out and weakened in some way or another and then as soon as it is that's when you see the dead spots and by the time you have dead spots it's uh, it's too late uh for that portion of your lawn it's funny you mention um the golf green so behind me is the uh oh is the green of uh, yeah. whole 12 at augusta it's the uh, first day of the masters today um and i was just thinking i was like i wonder how much you know turf management they put in especially in the weeks leading up to the tournament on that green right there like gotta be an insane amount of water um 
So we do have uh, a question here, and that's what would you recommend for lawn alternatives like wildflowers, uh, purslane, partridge berries? Um, there's a, a lot of those little mm -hmm. things. It, it depends. Are we in the sun? Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if you're just going to go for a lawn alternative, uh, 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 EcoTurf. Uh, the perennial peanut. Perennial yeah. peanut works pretty nice. Gives you some little yellow flowers and it, it's fairly short. It's good looking. It, it's uh, two disadvantages. One, uh, it needs full sun. And second, uh, it, it does tend to get zapped. Uh, with frost and, and stays brown until uh, it starts warming up and then it recovers really quick. So you, you also have to remember like what your use case is. Uh, if you have, you know, young children that are going to be running around the lawn, a lot of those ground covers are not going to uh, not going to take very well to a lot of foot traffic or parking your car on it for sure. Um, uh, so I, uh, the, the University of Florida, uh, they have a really good IFAS article on uh, different ground covers that kind of talks about some of the different uh, pros and cons to a bunch of the other ones. So uh, I, I'd, I'd start there because it really depends. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different uh, you know conditions that your lawn can have that sun. Some ground covers will work really well on, and some won't. So it's it's kind of hard to give a flat recommendation. Um, Bernie, I was going to ask you. Speaking of ground covers, we. Um, I was just at uh, my fiance's parents' house a few days ago, and they have these little tiny clover-looking plants, little small, small, small white and yellow flowers. And I was thinking, I was like, man, this stuff, you know, it it grows like crazy. It covers up. They have a St. Augustine lawn that's not all St. Augustine. Um, and it's growing up kind of over the St. Augustine. It looks, I mean, honestly, I think it looks fine. And they're, you know, freaking out about not having grass. And I'm like, this, <laughs> you know, it covers up the ground. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You guys don't have kids or anything running around the front lawn. It might be fine. Well, that, that's, you know, clover, there, there are a couple of varieties that do reasonably well. If, if you're an older person, you, you were a, a child in the 50s, then you remember things like four leaf clovers and, and, and a lawn that had dandelions and, and uh, we didn't have the monoculture. The, the uh, monoculture thing was, was a product uh, of advertising in the 50s. So it was a, a wonderful sales job. If, if you didn't have a great lawn and it wasn't all monoculture and, and didn't have all the weeds removed, you weren't a good husband and you weren't a good father. And, and it, and it worked and uh, yeah, people believe it huh yeah everybody thinks that that's the way it should be so uh i i have to commend those people for doing a great job of, of promoting their product but unfortunately uh it, it's made it difficult for people to accept lawns with anything yeah, that, that, to let go of that sentiment you know, yeah it's not perfect so oh and uh, by the way if, if you don't have uh, a lot of sun. If you have areas where there is no sun, you're, you've got oak trees. Uh, Asiatic jasmine works around mm -hmm. the uh, oak trees. Uh, normally, uh, uh, the said there's, azaleas work great underneath the trees. So They uh, said there's sun and shade. So you may be looking at, uh, you know, different different species for diff those different areas as different applications the asiatic jasmine takes pretty well uh in a shady area but it also is not really good uh for foot traffic if you walk on it it's probably not going to do very well um uh but moving on a little bit um we have i feel like a lot of people don't know about water restrictions like nestle well that is you know Corporations and stuff is a completely different ball game, especially when you're pulling. I mean, regulatory wise, when you're pulling from, especially a company like that that's you know producing a product that uh, some would deem to be necessary. Um, I do know that in Hernando County, anyway, we do have a lot of um, all, all the businesses are regulated uh, pretty much on the same on the same terms as our residents, uh, and then. Michael Stillman says, what kind of grass are we speaking of? Well, 
I believe this came up what we were talking about take all root rot, and that's going to be St. Augustine. I don't uh, does take all root rot affect any Florida other Tam, St. Augustine? That, that yeah, Flora Tam is is the major grass in our county. The the mm -hmm. uh, other major grass is uh, Bahia. There there are some uh, other uh, St. Augustines. Uh, bitter blue, I believe, only has to be mowed at two inches, and that's enough blade to provide full rootstock. Uh, but none of the, the other uh, St. Augustines have, have really taken over. There, there are some varieties that uh, get great big claims that they, they work fantastic. You know, the, the thing that made Floratam so great was uh, initially it was... Uh, chinch bug resistant well that lasted for about four or five years and then the chinch bugs either either it lost its resistance or the chinch bugs got smarter one one or the other but the the chinch bugs took over and and it was a big enough problem that uh, although it was 20 years ago people are still treating st augustine lawns like they did 20 years ago and and it's mm -hmm. totally inappropriate uh, but hay lawns, you can mow them at uh, three and a half inches. Problem with bahia is that it it tends it wants to reseed itself. It, it each one of the little uh, blades on bahia is an individual plant. So if if one dies, it leaves a little hole in the uh, lawn. And over a period of time, a few of them die, and you get some yeah. holes, and then you get some weeds. And the weeds shade out the grass, and then a few more die. And then you have more holes and, and it uh, tends to just go downhill. So if, if you're in a position where you can let it reseed itself and it, and it does uh, it puts up seed heads, you, you mow it. It thinks the cows came through and chewed it all up and it pops up these little seed heads with the V's on top. And, and we got these little things all over the lawn, uh, little black seeds on them. Uh, those seeds are for the most part, never going to germinate, but one or two will, and uh, mm -hmm. and they'll replace the the, the blades that, that get missed. But it takes a couple of weeks for that that seed head popping up to produce a viable grass. So if mm -hmm. if you're in a, um, a, a homeowners association situation, you usually can't let it go long enough uh, to do any good. Works great out on the highway. They, they come by, they mow it. They, as soon as they're done mowing, it pops up seed heads. They're not coming back for three or four weeks, and uh, the thing keeps itself reseeded. But uh, if, if you use bahia in a home situation, uh, you probably need to overseed uh, once or twice a year with a little seed. And it's expensive, but grass is yeah. expensive. You know, grass yeah. is a million plant in Florida. There, there are no lawn grasses that are happy in Florida. We're, we're trying to do something that shouldn't even be done. So, mm -hmm. um, back in Sumter County, well, especially on where I lived, um, very few HOAs. I, I lived in a big cow pasture. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, you didn't have to mow all the time. You pretty much, you might, you might mow the little bit around the house, but that's, you know, that's about it. And that is some of the, uh that was just it was always our lawn was always you know full and green until the grass went dormant it got a little brown and then it was all good um so i do think that uh you know you're in hoa you have to mow a lot that probably is going to have uh not it's not going to be good for for your grass if you're not letting those seed heads sit for a little while so uh michael says he has a he has bahai and it's a it's a disaster every weed known to man what advice do we have okay if, if you're going to do bahia the first thing you have to do is a soil test bahia is a, a grass that wants acid soil the optimum ph is 5.5 most soils in in our area are 6.5 to 7. Mm -hmm. that's that's the end of the range for Bahia. So Bahia is not going to be very happy. If, if you have a 7.2 or a 7.5 pH, Bahia is going to be a terrible lawn. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
the, the first thing you do is you get a, a soil test. And if, if the pH is acceptable, then after you, you put the Bahia in, you, you need to go in in uh, early spring before the weeds are started to pop up and put down a, a pre-emergent herbicide, something to stop the weed seeds from germinating. Mm -hmm. Then uh, about uh, 1st of May, you need to go through and the weeds that, that snuck it through the, and germinated, you need to use a weed killer that's for Bahia and get rid of the weeds. Now, once it gets above 85 degrees, the weed killers kill Bahia. You have to be really careful on that. And you cannot use uh, weed killers that are specific for St. Augustine's on Bahia. So they just damage the lawn. So, and then after you do all that, you need to mow it high. You need to mow it three and a half to four inches. And you need to... Uh, Oh, I guess they're closing the door. I'm, I'm talking too loud for the people. <laughs> so you, you, you uh, uh, need to uh, reseed once in a while, mm -hmm. and, and your lawn keeps going. Now, the thing about it is, remember that no lawn is happy in Florida. This isn't this isn't a case of we can go out and, and get a handful of fescue seed and throw it on the ground like you do up north. You're asking a plant to grow here that doesn't even want to be in Florida. So, you know, we're, we are just at that spot in the world where there aren't any grasses that really want to be in our area. And uh, grass is not a great plant. So, yeah, I think um, I remember if I remember correctly, a lot of those 2,4-D herbicides, um, you know, uh, under 85 degrees are safe to use on Bahia. That's, that's um, correct. Uh, so look for something because uh, a lot of them are not one. The stuff that you would buy as a consumer are not just one herbicide. It's uh, it's a combination of a couple different herbicides that do different stuff, take care of different plants. Because um, if you're dealing with different species of weeds in your yard, one thing probably isn't going to kill them all. Um, so they have a combination and they're trying to make that, you know, that exact combination that can kill everything but Bahia. Um, so it kind of, it, 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 you do kind of have to do your research, um, definitely. Uh, and then moving down the comments here, uh, Michael says as well, water is 7.4. Yeah, you're, you're in, uh, all that's pulling from calcium carbonate. So it's all going to be a little bit basic. That's what all of our bedrock is here anyway. Um. Which is why the the pHs are a little bit a little bit higher, um, and then that's why plants do so much better with rainwater mm -hmm. than they do with well water. The, yep. the uh, carbon dioxide in rainwater uh, forms a carbonic mm -hmm. acid and tends to lower the pH, and you have a, a nice soft water with no calcium or other minerals in it and uh, the the plants really like it the, mm -hmm. yeah. you're giving me flashbacks to organic chemistry i don't want to think about any onic acids for a while <laughs> i'm still not i'm not okay doing that yet um and uh to move on a little bit what is the best fertilizer to use on your lawn so that's a that's actually a tough question and one that should definitely be answered by going to your local extension office and getting a soil test done, it's 10 bucks. They're gonna tell you exactly what nutrients that your soil is deficient in. You tell them what grass you have, what you're trying to grow. Um, in, in our county, uh, we have plenty of uh, phosphate. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, ideally, uh, what we need is, is nitrogen and potassium. And uh, the, the commercial people, like to use nitrogen and put it down several times a year and they they use it in a liquid form and they like that because the nitrogen makes it go green and it it shows something and the people are happy because they feel like they got their money's worth mm -hmm. create some problems um the 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 thing that happens is the the lawn is always growing uh 
uh, it produces more thatch that way and uh, it doesn't really help the root structure so if, if, if you could get a, a lawn fertilizer that had equal nitrogen and potassium like 15 O15 don't need the phosphorus uh, we need the potassium and the nitrogen mm -hmm. uh, get slow release fertilizer granular and and apply it twice a year that would be all that you need that that is great fertilizer and and that works best on either Bahia or St. Augustine unfortunately it that's not what people sell so uh, you you want a fertilizer with the least phosphorus and the most potassium that you can get mm -hmm. so. um, and you you have to remember that uh, growth is a stressor so that gra that grass when it's growing is stressed out so by putting it into that grow mode all the time by multiple you know nitrogen fertilizations a year uh you you mean yeah sure it'll be green but it's also going to be stressed out um but moving on a little more uh, what's the ideal ground cover well that is a loaded question <laughs> it's really it really depends on where you're at it's uh it's kind of tough to uh, to make that recommendation without, you know, getting a soil test, having all that stuff up. And you really need well, to know, you know, the conditions of your lawn when it comes to sunshade, how much water you know, gets, etc. That's one of those things. The truth is there are places where grass is the ideal ground cover. You, you've got a young child that wants to play out in the backyard. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is obviously a great place for grass. Yep. Um, if, if you want to put in some islands and, and, and put in flowers and, and uh, specimen plants and, and have showy islands, then grass really makes those things kick up and, and look mm -hmm. great. So the, the ideal ground cover is, is dependent on what's going with it. And the, yeah. the picture behind you, there, there are things, the grass goes right up and then, and then there's things covering the, 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 ground in the background mm -hmm. and that that is ground cover any anything that that is, is there besides uh trees bare dirt ground cover. trees yeah so i think that's all i mean they have these mulch i believe that's all pine straw um under there but um you have to remember like this landscape is is your landscape it's for you, you have to remember it's not only just what's what works the best you have to have to uh, take into account your needs what you need it f like you know what you're planning to do with it because you you don't want to go plant like i said a bunch of asiatic jasmine and then have your little kid run around on it because one he's not going to have a good time no, and neither is the asiatic jasmine so um if it's, you got it, dogs, it, you, yeah, you, and yeah. dogs too yeah okay. um so that's uh the, the that's really a, a super case by case on um uh, what the ideal ground cover is. It's all, it all goes back to that first principle of Florida friendly landscaping, which is right plant, right place, where you take into account all of your site conditions, what your needs are, um, et cetera. So another question here is rainwater safe to use coming off a shingle roof. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you, I mean, that's where all that rain barrel water comes from. And, um, I've heard pretty good stuff, pretty good uh, results from people watering their plants with that rain barrel water. Um, the plants like soft water. The plants really like soft water. I, I can't think of many plants that, that don't like soft water. Mm -hmm. um, especially here in Florida, almost all of the water you get from the ground if it's not treated. I've, I've lived in a lot of <laughs> stinky yeah. water houses in my life because I mean how where I'm where I'm from like nobody has uh everyone's on a well every single person and more than half of those have stinky egg water and that's you just well, that's the, what you got the thing about it is the reason we have all those sinkholes is that the rock is dissolved into the water and mm -hmm. and left a big empty space uh, as far as as support there's yeah. nothing but water down there so wow. the water table All gets low enough is, those, is in the water man. yeah those karst formations just woof, and then you have a big old hole in the ground um 
Michael says a fifteen zero fifteen fertilizer. If it, at one point there were some companies that made fifteen oh fifteen, and that was the university recommendation, and then you couldn't get fifteen oh fifteen, but you could get seventeen oh seventeen, which you know the only difference is how much you apply, and then the seventeen oh seventeen didn't sell all that well, and and now it's back to uh, real high nitrogen, medium potassium, and some phosphorus thrown in. But fifteen oh fifteen or that that ilk, if if you can find some, is is perfect for our county. Mm-hmm. If, if you're it, in a county that it's up north and you don't have as much phosphorus, maybe that's not correct. You may, you may want some uh, maybe fifteen. Four fifteen or something mm-hmm. like that, but and but that's where that soil test comes in, is it? Because they'll tell you. I mean, they can look at they can look at what's in your soil and tell you exactly what nutrients are uh, you need and what you're missing, uh, and what you have a lot of. Um, so moving on a little bit, uh, Teresa put some really good links here to um, both of the ground cover articles. I've read about it. Um, Little pines growing. Could I trim as it grows for pine mulch? No. Yeah. Simple answer. I am at my desk today. I'm not back in the crypt, so my phone's ringing right now, and I can't. We can't really do much about it. So we're gonna listen to the Looney Tunes uh, track play here for a minute. But to keep going, um, two big dogs. Kids play soccer. Love walking around the property. Then a lot of those ground covers grass might be the right thing. Uh, for you guys. Um, you know, it, it depends on the property. If, if most of the, the um, big playing fields are, are uh, Bermuda grass. And Bermuda has a lot of terrible things going for it as a lawn, but it, it works good uh, for playing fields for some reason. So, uh, baseball courts and, and that kind of thing. Uh, counties use uh, Bermuda in those situations. And, and there are a few places where Bermuda would be a good thing. Golf courses use a lot of Bermuda. Yeah, um, I would not want to putt on a, on a Bay, a bay of Green. That would be terrible. No. Um, I do, like, <laughs> when I was, uh, go off on our little tangent of the day here, uh, when I was in high school, I, was on, I played uh, golf, and I tried my, my dad tried his hardest to grow uh grow me a putting service in the backyard did not work just didn't we couldn't get it to go um so i got a sheet of astroturf that we laid on the driveway and that's what it ended up being but um to keep moving down here uh rerouted our sprinklers to come from the well instead of the softener was that a bad move no that that that's a smart move um, you know, the, the thing about it is that the softened water still has a lot of things in it that, mm-hmm. uh, you don't get rid of. What it does is get rid of some of the calcium, but, uh, for the most part, it, it really doesn't make much difference whether you're using, uh, water softener to, or, or straight water. The, the thing about it is you're not going through as much salt and yeah that's water what softener, I was say. Uh, does end up with some salt and the salt's not really good for the, the lawn so uh it, it's you know it, it's a toss-up the amount of salt mm-hmm. you get because it's a, uh, from a softener probably offsets the fact that it's soft water so uh and, yeah i you know it, i just know it takes one half dozen of the other yeah, but it's well, a my lot last fancy with softened water. My last house that we lived in, I feel like I was buying salt every week, so I can only imagine. And I did not was not irrigating, so I can only imagine how much salt you'd go through trying to irrigate um, irrigate using that softened water. Um, I don't think they were satisfied with the the answer uh, to the pine question about um, this one right here. Why can they not trim that pine tree as it's growing? 
I, I think I might know the answer, but I'm going to go for it. Trimming young pine trees. I, I mm. think that that if, if you know that that is damaging. I think so. Yeah. If you if you want those plants to grow to uh, to adulthood, then you probably want to let them go uh, for a while. If you really think about it, out in the wild, out in the woods, uh, so many. The, the percentage of those pine trees that make it to full adulthood is so low. It's so low. So um, you have to think, like, if you can help them out, that obviously the percentage of pines that are cared for is going to go, it's going to be a lot higher. But um, they, 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 they do need a little help, I think. Um, can we grow caper bush in Central Florida? Where can they buy the plant or the seeds? We're gonna have to have Teresa look that up. I have no idea. Um, and I was gonna mention this before. Uh, the current recommendation from the University of Florida is not to use that, um, not to use that rain barrel water for like. Don't drink it. Don't feed it to your animals or uh, give it to your animals to drink. Don't put it in your swimming pool and don't use it on your edibles. Um, that there's a whole lot of studies on this and feel free to do your own research but that is the official recommendation of the university is not to use it on um edibles i've read a whole lot of papers on this and i i really i've had a hard time making up my mind even so um i'm going to well, defer to, to the folks at uf what they're saying i'm going to tell you a little story i i uh, bought a bunch of little animal things uh uh, cyclops and and paramecians and amoebas and, and 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 just grew them to see if I could do it and and I needed something to feed them and and the the way you get something to feed all these guys is you take a glass of water and you put a, a piece of rice in the bottom of the glass of water one one little grain of rice and you let it sit out on a table and at the end of three or four days there's things growing in that water you can't imagine. And and you get bacteria and you get little animals. And and pretty soon it gets to the point where there's a lot of if, if you leave a, a this glass with one little piece, one little grain of rice sitting on a table, it develops a, a, a great community. And then you use that water and and, and you feed the, the rest of the animals, the little cyclops and things. So if, if you can get that from the water in your or from the air in your house, just imagine what's floating around outside waiting for an opportunity to survive. So those rain barrels that are sitting there, all, all the little critters that were growing on your roof are washed down into that water. Uh, and, and then they sit there and, and because they're now food for other critters, more critters come along. And, and of course, you got mosquito larvae, and uh, they they survive in that water. The, the water out in in the in the wild someplace, if it's sitting there still, it's got things growing in it. And although they're so small, you don't see them; they're there. And uh, so, you do not want to drink water that is run off the roof because it contains all the things that have grown on the roof over a long period of time. Uh, so there you go. There's your answer. Um, yeah, no, um, visual recommendation is not to, but like I said, there's a whole lot of studies on it. So, so feel free I, to do your I, research. I wouldn't, but... I wouldn't worry about putting it on the plants as long as you were uh, not pouring the the water on the parts that you were going to eat in other words i wouldn't i wouldn't uh use it on lettuce leaves uh, mm -hmm. but you could you could use it out to side dress water along the lettuce uh, and and you could use it in that that respect on most plants but i would not put it on uh anything that you were going to eat Um, and then, uh, moving on here, uh, they don't intend for the pines to grow, just peeking through their bushes. Oh, in that case, 
if, if they don't want them to grow up, go ahead and do whatever have, you want with them. You know, pines only have one marrow stem. So if, if you chop out the top, you foul up the pine. Mm -hmm. They only want to grow off the top. Um, and then I uh, haven't tried the rain barrel method. Did not know about not to use for edibles. What is the purpose for them actually? Well, the, the rain barrel provides you with soft water or low pH water that is ideal for most plants. You know, if, if you have flowers, you the the whole flower can take it. If, if you're if you're using it in a garden, uh, you don't want to put it on the edible portions. In other words, you you could use it to water tomato plants, but you wouldn't water the tomatoes. So. Uh, I'm I'm not so sure that there aren't some. Uh, it, it's like gray water. Uh, the the a lot of cities sell gray water, and it, it's used for irrigation, but it's not used uh, uh, on uh, edible plants. I think um. I I think it's a little cleaner than than gray water, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how you should look at it. Just. Don't don't drink out of your rain barrel. That's that's my big the big takeaway I want everyone to get from there. I was really trying to figure out about these this caper bush. I didn't even know what that was. Um, and it seems like it's it it. So if you look up what hardiness zone, it's in. Let me go back up here and find this question. Um, it says eight to ten, but this is a Mediterranean plant, which means it's probably like a California eight to ten and not a Florida eight to ten. If I had to guess. Um, it's probably too wet here if I, you know, my five minutes of research opinion. Um, and UF does not have any articles on it, which means it probably doesn't grow uh, well here. Um, moving on a little bit, we have, I wish that some kind of filter to filter the water going to the rain barrel. Um, there is a, there are, there is a screen on the top i think the intention there is to keep leaves um any animals from going in there or and i've heard that the there's not people don't typically have a lot of mosquito problems it's a pretty fine screen um but uh i don't know i feel like those filters they they slow down the flow of water so much if you have a good one that you'd end up just filling your gutters up with water and then they'd fall off the side of your house well, the, the thing about it is, if, if you had a little pond in your backyard and you were taking water from that pond and watering your garden, would you water the edible part of the plants that you were going to have? The, the water that comes out of the rain barrel is no worse than the water that comes out of a pond. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the water that comes out of the rain barrel is no worse than the water that comes out of some of the wells. You know, if, if, if you have uh, a well in an area that's contaminated and you don't know it, uh, you could use that water for a lot of purposes that you shouldn't. Uh, the, we're not telling you that the rain barrel water is, is bad. We're telling you that you should exercise some due diligence mm -hmm. uh, with any water that you're using, uh, be it pond water, rain barrel water, uh, water out of a faucet. You know, that if, if, if you have a, an, an area where uh, the water sits a long time, uh, the, uh, I, I worked in an airport and we had this big exotic uh, sprinkler system. And, and there's a big sign out there on the uh, sprinkler system that says, this water is not potable. Now, and it's because it sat there in those pipes for a long period of time. It's not that it isn't good water. It, it, was, it was the same water that comes out of the faucet that we drink. But any water that sits a long time or sits out in the open gets contaminated. 
everything gets contaminated. That's the way the world operates. So uh, you know, that's that's why the, the county puts chlorine in, in the, the water that they're sending out there. That's to temporarily uh, ensure that you won't have a problem. But you can't take county water, put it in a bucket and let it sit a month and, and then drink it. it that's not yeah. the way things work. If you found a, you know, the water bottle that rolled under the seat of your car, you have to be pretty thirsty to drink it. You know what I mean? You don't, I don't know how long that's been there. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking month old water bottle water personally. Um, uh, but moving along here. Let's see. Uh, I, I had a, a, an interesting one in this morning. A uh, lady brought in a uh, magnolia tree branch and it had. Uh, one of the little uh, air plants on it and she was concerned that uh, it might be damaging your tree you know there there are a lot of air plants that, that grow uh, in Florida and mm -hmm. uh, for the most part they're they're kind of like in the bromeliad family and uh, they don't attach to the plant that other than uh, physically they, they do not have any uh, anything absorbing uh, nutrients out of the plant and and they're they're really kind of neat they, they uh, Spanish moss is, is one of them um, I, I, I think that, that probably Spanish moss is the one that we get the most uh, people asking how do we get rid of it generally if, if you have a lot of Spanish moss in a plant it's, it's because the plants under stress and and the uh, canopy uh, provides a lot of open space that the uh, Spanish moss can hang on to. Uh, for the most part, it really doesn't hurt the plant. If you got an oak tree and it's got Spanish moss hanging off of it, it doesn't hurt the oak tree. Like every oak tree has Spanish, Spanish moss hanging off yeah, every single one. But, but <laughs> some some plants get such an accumulation that it starts to interfere with the photosynthesis of the plant. Mm -hmm. and, and you do have to remove it. And, and there isn't any good chemical to spray on Spanish moss and get rid of it. If, if you use a copper-based fungicide on it, that does zap it, but it turns it into a mush, which is harder to get off than the Spanish moss was. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just not a good thing. And, uh, and that's in the same family as pineapples. It, it's it, it's amazing. And, and if you go out and start looking real close, there, a lot of times you can find the little tiny flowers. And it's amazing how small they are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and there's a whole community of things that, that uh, you know, maybe you've got a bat living in the uh, Spanish moss. and uh, Yeah, I uh, never know what, what's in there. I remember as a kid, just, we, you know, that was something we did on the weekend. It's like, go get that wheelbarrow and you're going to fill it up six times full of Spanish moss. You're going to be real itchy afterwards and get it done. <laughs> um, uh, but moving down here, uh, my property is predominantly sand hill, says Mike. What type of plants could I look to use to begin natural soil amendment without having to go spend money to dump truckloads of soil or mulch on a quarter acre plot? Well, oh, yeah. you know, that, there again, I, what first thing you want to do is get a, a soil test. Mm -hmm. You make up, make up your mind. Do we want predominantly grass or do we want predominantly landscape plants? Mm -hmm. Or do you want 50 50 or whatever? And, and do a soil test and, and, you know, if, if this sand hill is, is a, a three and a half or a, a five and a half pH, it, it's a natural put in Bahia grass where you need grass. And if it's, mm -hmm. if it's seven and a half or eight, uh, we're going to have to do something different than Bahia anyway. Yeah. Um, compost is probably the absolute best thing you can use to start improving the, the soil. Compost does a lot of good things because it, it already has a lot of uh, little microbes living in it. And, and it's, it's generally the microbes in the soil 
that make the nutrients available. So if, if mm -hmm. you have sterile sand and you plant something, uh, it's just generally not going to do very well. So you, you need to have enough organic material that uh, the microbes uh, will work. I've heard of people that, that use sugar thinking that sugar was feeding the plant. Well, sugar doesn't feed the plant, but sometimes sugar will feed the, the microbes and the microbes will help make nutrients available to the plant. So uh, you get some plant growth that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise because of the, the availability that, that the microbes have, have created for you. So uh, compost, it, it, get whatever compost you can. The more compost, the merrier. That, that stuff only lasts a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when you get the plants in, if, if you use mulch uh, and, and keep the mulch up the, as the mulch decays, it also adds organic material to the soil. Mm -hmm. By the way, pure sand doesn't really hold anything. If, if, mm -hmm. if you put fertilizer on pure sand, it goes right through. As soon as you get a rain, everything just leaches right through. If you have organic material in the soil, the organic material electrically bonds to all these minerals. And the organic material stops the leaching or it slows it way down mm -hmm. so that, that these things become available to the plant. So uh, organic material of some kind, either uh, mulch or compost, is, is I can't overemphasize how important that is. If, if you have poor soil, that's that's where yeah. you start improving the soil. Yeah. Just, just so going you, out buying truckloads of, of, of soil won't do any good because it's going to leach out. And it's going to disappear. It, it's the things being replaced. OK, you, you really need to get a soil sample. That mm -hmm. That is important. And, and just to add a little bit of context, uh, he says it's going to be used for a food forest. So predominantly edibles just all what was there it seems okay um that's that's good because if you're going to do a food, food for us that means that we can plant some trees that are going to give us some uh product uh, you know we not only can we get uh the food off of the trees some fruit but we're going to have the leaves adding organic material to our soil so uh you know that that's a place you put in a low quat tree and mm -hmm. uh, and those things will grow just about anywhere uh, uh, maybe uh a mulberry tree well on a, on a quarter acre lot i wouldn't put a mulberry that that would be asking for problems but <laughs> yeah you have to stay on top of it um i mean there's a lot of and there's a lot of plants that native cool plants i think that just grow in sand hill naturally so um might be something to look into uh moving along here pre-filter kittens of sevs that work really well i'll have to look into that i haven't looked too much into the rain barrel filtering uh stuff um my bush bean leaves are turning brown. What is a common disease um, and how to treat? Uh, turning brown on the tips uh, often is, is an indication of a root problem or watering problem. Um, and the terrible part about it is you can't tell just by looking whether it's too much water or not enough water. Uh, if, if the leaves are turning brown, uh, in the middle of the leaves, that's generally a, a bad indication. Um, the, the, the fungal diseases, uh, on most of those things, uh, you can treat um, with Dacanel. Dacanel is a, a good fungicide for all that stuff. Okay. Um, next question. What do you think about grow bags? I think that's a great way to, to grow things. Put a plant in a grow bag and let her go. Yeah, I've seen I've seen quite a few different um, 
uh, different ways that people are doing. It, you know, the concept's very similar. You, something you can move around. Um, I I saw those portable uh, portable raised beds. I thought those were neat. I can't remember what they were called. Someone we talked about it, uh, a couple weeks ago. I I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think all that stuff's great. Any, anything that's going to get more people growing stuff and learning about plants, I think, is great. Um, you know, you could just move. take a bag of potting soil, poke a hole in it, plant a plant yeah, in it. Yeah, it'll probably be fine. <laughs> um, moving along here. I'm actually starting some mulberry and loquat currently. I've been chopping and dropping cassava around the property for a while to start putting some biomass down so thanks for the thorough answer that's what we do here is thorough answer sometimes they they might be a little too thorough we've been told um of course yeah you're welcome um and michael here asks how to treat powdery mildew on squash and cantaloupe that canal that's a you question i'm not sure that canal all of, all those fungal diseases use bacchanal. Hmm. Um. Well, we're getting. That, by the way, is, is a uh, uh, an indication of a uh, generally a watering problem. Uh, try not to uh, leave the leaves wet uh, on on any of these plants. If you can water underneath the plant, that is so much better. If you water water in the morning so that they mm -hmm. don't so it don't evaporate not during wet the day. Time. Yeah, that and, uh, and I'm I'm serious about Dacanel. That that is a very very good product in that uh, for the homeowner, uh, it pretty much treats all the fungal diseases on just about all the plants you've got, and and it's a very safe thing. D a c o n i l. D a c o n i l. And that he says that they're in hydroponics. I don't know anything about hydroponics. I don't either. <laughs> We've got this. this little the leaves hydroponics. never get the leaves never get wet. Is what he's saying. Okay. Okay. I'm that's... not a hydroponics guy. <laughs> D A C O N I L. There we go. I need to learn to speak plainer, I think. No, I, I, I think we're all good. Um, we are getting a little close on time here, so I do want to tell everybody uh, what's going on over here with um, the Extension Office and their Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So on... Uh, Saturday, April the 20th, we are having our Earth Day, Florida Friendly Earth Day celebration. That's going to be at the Master Garden Gardener Nursery um, on Oliver Street in Brooksville. It's behind the fairgrounds right off of 41. I think we're going to be out there from about 9 to 12. Um, there's going to be all kinds of informational booths there. They're going to be selling uh, tons of Florida Friendly plants. Um, they have a lot of natives. They have some of the ground covers that we've mentioned. Um, and uh, I think there'll be face painting and other activities for the kids. Um, so please come out and enjoy that Earth Day celebration with us. Um, uh, I have links to that's that uh, that event on my link tree right here. Um, that'll route you to a Facebook page. Um, also on Wednesday, April 17th, so next Wednesday, we are having a compost bin rain barrel workshop that's going to be at my office here in the admin building. Um, and uh, you can sign up for that once again at my link tree. I think this is the second link there. I think the first one's Earth Day. Um, and just fill it out for them. You'll be on the list and then you can come if you're a Hernando County resident and get a free, zero dollars, completely free compost bin. Um, and, uh, and, or, uh, rain barrel for the rain barrel, $66, uh, that's at our cost. And you get, if you're a utilities customer, you get a $35 rebate on your water bill. So 
um, that's what we have there. If you have any questions, not right now, that you need to speak to somebody later, you can call the IFAS office or the extension office right here uh, at the number on the screen or email all your really difficult, really tough questions right to Dr. Phil. Um, his email is on the screen there. So um, looking right here, just any last minute questions we have. Remulch at any of the landfill sites. I'm not sure. Oh, I, well, I think the main landfill you can get, I, I wouldn't call it mulch, but it is like the yard waste that they've ground up. You'd have to call um, solid waste and recycling for that. And I have their number right here. Their phone number is 352-754-4112. Um, you can call them and ask them what their policy is on all of that. I do know they have a lot of it at the main landfill over towards Citrus County. Um, Michael asked, can he just bring soil by? Well, we do not do the actual soil test. It's shipped the, to Gainesville. The, the, the soil test goes uh, to the university. So uh, we'll give you the form and uh, a little bag that you put the soil in. Uh, you send a sample to the university with a check for $10. They send back, they, they tell you what the recommendation is for your particular plant you know if you say i i have bahia grass uh they come back and they tell you what your ph is what ph you want uh, how to get the ph adjusted uh what nutrients it needs and they tell you what all the little minor nutrients are in your soil it, it's a, a super deal and uh it, it's an amazing thing uh, to, to watch it being done i've been there several times um and it, it's it's Probably the best bargain is it, it is a bargain, you know, $10 mm -hmm. for and all that information. Uh, you you would you, can't get that any place else. And, the, and you pay a little, lot of money for a, one of these done privately. Like it's, yeah, it's these little super expensive. You, you buy in a store to, to tell if you've got enough nitrogen or potassium or whatever, uh, the soil pH. Those things are phony. Uh, they, they have very, very, very low accuracy. Uh, Mm -hmm. The uh, Sumter County uh, office had, had decided that they were going to uh, do soil tests in-house. So they bought this, this really nice, high-quality laboratory setup, and they found out that uh, they couldn't begin to get close to uh, what the university's uh, super setup was telling people. So... Mm -hmm. uh, they they abandoned it. it. It they they couldn't even hit pH consistently. You know, if if if, if man brought the same soil in four days in a row, he got four different numbers. So that uh, stuff's uh, yeah, it's, it's really sad. tough. And they have they have unspeakable amounts of money invested in being able to tell you all these things. Um, exactly. So we got one more question here before we wrap up. Um, I have a fiddle leaf fig tree. I've been keeping an indirect light outside under a tree canopy. It hasn't grown any leaves in months despite fertilizing in regular water. What could I be doing wrong? Uh, that could be a problem with uh, nematodes. The, uh, the, the plants tend to be somewhat susceptible um, and, and if, if they get a, a high nematode loading, uh, it, it tends to stunt their growth. And mm -hmm. if it's not going backwards, I, I wouldn't worry about it. If it's going backwards, uh, I'd actually dig it up and move it. Well, there you go. All righty. Well, it is time for us. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, um, listen to us today and asking all your questions if you guys didn't do that and uh be so responsive we would not do this each week so um once again i hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a great weekend we'll see you next week